Good afternoon and good evening. I am Sister Rosemary Nassif from Loyola Marymount University. As we gather together during Black History Month, we are reminded of the rich diversity among us, all created, each one created in God's image. So we invite you to put your name and your diocese in the chat room for our inspiration in, the, in knowing the diversity of all the students among our schools in Catholic education, all the geographies and realities that are among us. And to be also reminded, oh, happy day, oh, happy day, and what a blessing, what a blessing. We now turn it over to our moderators and all the parts within us, the graces within us that are so connected to so many differences, so much richness and blessing that we have among us. So we turn it over to our moderators. Yes, oh, happy day and hello again. And welcome to the third session of our board development virtual series sponsored by Loyola Marymount University in partnership with Creighton, St. Edwards and Mount St. Mary's Universities. I'm Dr. Regina Haney, and along with my partner in crime, Heather Gossert, we're delighted to lead you through these outstanding sessions on board development. Thank you for your enthusiastic and affirming evaluations of our first two sessions. And know that we have taken your suggestions very serious, seriously to make this program even better. We promise you that today's presentation on board organization and engagement is going to be very interactive and informative. So whether you're a board member or school administrator, you're going to find this session a wonderful opportunity to expand and enrich your professional expertise, but also steps toward creating a board that provides strategic leadership. So as we prepare to begin our presentation, don't forget to put in the chat room who you are and the diocese or area in which you are from. So let us begin as we begin all things by asking God's blessing on our work today. Most gracious Lord, we come before you today, lifelong learners, seeking the wisdom and grace to be true servant leaders, ever ready to engage and affirm those who are co-investors in this very sacred mission of our Catholic schools. We seek always to have the wisdom to see and the courage to act in ways that glorify you and the institutions that we so faithfully serve. Create in us, O oh Lord, an openness and a zeal to grow in faithful fidelity to your word. We ask that you guide our hearts and our minds today as we seek always in all things to be your faithful disciples. Amen. Heather, will you begin and go through some housekeeping items and reminders for us, please? Certainly, thank you, Regina. I have just a few reminders for our participants today. You already know that in lieu of a registration fee, we have asked that you make a donation to your favorite Catholic school or charity. And thank you to those of you who have already done so. Secondly, we wanna remind you that participants who engage in all six sessions will receive a certificate of completion from Loyola Marymount University. Unfortunately, participants who miss more than two sessions will not be eligible for the certificate. So we hope you can be with us for all of these exciting sessions. You will as always have the opportunity to evaluate the sessions. We urge you to take the opportunity to do so. 
the evaluation instrument can be found in your chat box at the conclusion of the session. Your comments from the first two sessions were both insightful and affirming. Keep those comments coming for us. We encourage you to both comment and ask questions during the presentation. You're going to use the chat room to do this. And Regina and I are gonna be monitoring the chat room and we'll make sure that your questions and comments get to our presenters. We're also pleased to remind you that all of the sessions are being recorded and will be available to you at the conclusion of the series for a limited period of time. If you have any questions at all during the series, please contact Regina Haney at rhaney at verizon.net. And finally, and most importantly, let's have a good time as we grow and as we learn from one another. Yes, and let the good times roll. Absolutely. Our third session, Board Organization and Engagement, is presented by Mr. Dan Curtin and Dr. Ryan Killian. So, Heather? Yes, it is my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Dan Curtin, uh, a personal friend and colleague for many years. He is a Catholic educator whose contributions to the growth and sustainability of our Catholic schools has been recognized by two papal awards. Dan has served as both a high school teacher and chief administrator, and in 1985 was selected by the Archbishop of Washington, James Cardinal Hickey, to serve as his secretary for Catholic education in the Archdiocese of Washington. In 1999, Dan was appointed as executive director at NCEA, and Dan has an extensive board knowledge, both at the secondary and the university level. He has served on numerous boards and councils and is the past chair of the governing board at St. Mary's University. Currently, Dan continues to share his time and his talent as an adjunct professor at Marymount University in Arlington, Virginia. We are delighted to have Dan today. And his co-presenter, Dr. Ryan Killian. And I know for sure that Ryan does a fantastic job leading his board and they're just not rubber stamp board members. It's not a rubber stamp board. His board is very engaged and involved and in great discussions, they are strategic leaders and, and they have great conversations to work the school toward its best future. So Dr. Ryan Killian is a distinguished Catholic school educator who has served as both principal and president of Catholic schools. During his tenure as principal of St. Paul School in Princeton, New Jersey, his school was recognized as a National Blue Ribbon School of Excellence. Dr. Killian received his doctoral degree from Seton Hall University, and since 2018 has served as the president and chief executive officer of Norwood Fanfan Academy in Philadelphia, which has recently celebrated its 100th anniversary. And I think you had a very, very successful campaign. Was it $100,000 that you were able to raise, Ryan? So I present to you, I present to you our, our co-presenters. Well, thank you, Regina. Thank you, Heather. Um, it's Dan and I are um, thrilled to be with you. Um, I have to say, Heather, I'm, I'm glad I didn't know Dan's full bio before tonight, or I would have been way too intimidated to work with him all these weeks getting ready for tonight. Um, I had the Cliff's Notes version, so I'll have to really up my game tonight. Um, but I, I also just, I loved the word zeal being part of Dr. Haney's remarks and the prayer. Um, zeal is actually, so we, I currently am a partner in mission with the Sisters of St. Joseph in my role at Nord Fontbonne Academy and zeal is one of the, the core foundational words for all of them. And as we approach 
working with our boards, it can seem like intimidating, really heavy lifting and difficult work. But if we do it with zeal and with enthusiasm, it can be truly transformational and certainly worth the investment of all the time and effort. Uh, thank you, uh, Ryan, and, and thanks uh, for the uh, warm introductions we both have received. Um, I have to say that I learned a lot about uh, board work and board leadership uh, when I served on the board at Bishop McNamara High School in Forestville, Maryland, uh, when uh, Heather Gossard was, uh, was president of the school. And uh, we had a, a good working relationship, uh, not only with the board, but also with the Brothers of Holy Cross, uh, who sponsor Bishop McNamara along with about 17 or 18 other schools across the nation. So it's good to be with you all. I thought we would start tonight by uh, talking about, I said tonight, I should say this afternoon because of the West Coast, uh, what are the learning outcomes that we're hoping to achieve through this, uh, this evening's presentation? And what we hope to do is to develop a deeper understanding of the critical partnership of the board chair and the head of school. This is critical. That's a, that's a very important uh, word, a critical relationship between the board chair and the head of school. They need to understand what each other's role is and how they can work collaboratively. Our second outcome would be to explore ways to best train and engage the board. You know, it's one thing to uh, appoint and to suggest board members uh, to a particular board, but it's also critically, critically important that they be properly trained and know what their role is as a member of a governing board or an advisory council uh, for a school. Uh, I have to relate one funny story uh, very quick. Uh, I was served on, on one of my parish school uh, councils and we had one uh, member of that council who was only upset with the principal's recess policy. That's all she was interested in. And I said, that's not what we're about. We're about a broader picture. And so it is important that, that board members understand what they can and what they cannot do. And then finally, uh, to highlight ways to deepen the role and understanding of the board in the school, not only in the school, but also within the parish community. Uh, that, that is very, very important. Let me jump to the next slide. This is a quote I uh, came across. Um, it says, an effective group spirit on a board is one that attracts its members makes them want to work with one another and gives them a sense of pride and satisfaction in the program and in the board itself. That is very, very important. The next slide, please. I found this to be someplace, I don't know where I had this, but it said in the, Mark Twain said, in the first place, God made idiots. That was for practice. Then he made school boards. Uh, I hope there's no connection between idiots and school boards, but I don't think there is. But it, this is a quote I came across and uh, thought I would add it in here. Uh, next slide, Ryan or Dan, right? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, getting the right people on the bus. So probably a lot of you or many of you may be familiar with the work Good to Great from Jim Collins. And it really, you know, your work starts in the very beginning with identifying those folks who can really have an impact in your board. And as Dan said, you can't have any, you know, one issue candidates that have an agenda. They really have to wanna be in this for the right reasons. And they really have to bring their unique perspective. So having a balance of views and perspectives and giving those members who accept the invitation to be on your board, really meaningful work to do. We, we can't ask people to just rubber stamp or to just you know, sign off on initiatives and be a board member in name only. The hard heavy lifting is gonna happen at the committee level, which we'll get into later in the presentation. But finding those folks that really have the engagement, have the commitment and the passion is truly where the work begins and where the work could end if you don't do it correctly and you don't make that investment in getting the right people on the bus as they say. Next slide. 
So this image, you know, goes back to the concept of having that diversity of perspectives and experiences on your board. And certainly, especially as we began tonight, um, being mindful of gathering during Black History Month, it reminds us that our all of our schools are unique and diverse in our constituents, both our current students and families, our alumni, our staff, and the larger community. If we are in a parish school, if we're in a diocesan school, or in a school that's owned and operated by a religious congregation, your board has to reflect the diversity of experiences that you have in your school. And your school has to reflect a respect for diversity and belonging. That is core to Catholic social teaching. And we look at how we are called to be in solidarity. So certainly that could be a call to allyship um, and to having that connection and a call to your family, to the families and communities who are participating. So it, it is really a mission that we have to take seriously and be mindful of. And it can be challenging um, to recruit. And you wanna certainly make sure that you're looking at diversity from every possible lens so that you're not only having alumni that are 20 years out into their career, you're having young alumni and you're not only having parents that all had kids there at the same period in time. Um, and maybe you're having folks from your larger community that have an investment in your school, but maybe they didn't attend and maybe they didn't have children attend, but they bring that perspective. They might be a real active member of the parish. Um, in my last school, I, it was a parish school and one of the things that I took great pride in was when parishioners who had never actively been part of the school by having their children attend or attending themselves would refer to the school as our school because that is who it needs to be. It needs to be something that is owned by the full community. Next slide. This is an important slide because it points to what are the differences between a head of school and a board chair. And I think this has to be very clear, not only to the school community, uh, but also to the board members uh, that they understand this connection and what the role of each one is. Sometimes board members and other members uh, of the school community uh, may jump into a, uh, a different area that they shouldn't jump into. But if you look at the head of school, whether it be a headmaster, headmistress, uh, president, a CEO, whatever title they have, their role is to be a regular proactive collaborator with the board chair. In other words, the board chair and the head of school really have to be on the same page. And that occurs through regular and uh, frequent conversations, just checking in with one another. Uh, and that would be the second point under head of school, regular communication with the board chair. Uh, you know, you don't want any surprises. And I think it's important that, uh, that that be that good connection. It is the leader, the head of school is the leader of the school in all aspects of the school operation and responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of the school. And then if you look at the board chair, and these are very quick summaries, the first point is a regular proactive collaboration with the head of school. Again, that goes back to the head of school and the importance of collaboration uh, between the, the board and the head of school and the head of the board. It's very, very important. The board chair leads the board. The principal, the headmaster, the president does not lead the board. That's the job of the board chair. And the board chair really should participate in board committee meetings. I have found this to be extremely valuable so that there are no surprises, if you will. But it also shows the importance that the board chair uh, shows in terms of the other members of the board, how important they see their role if this board chair, if he or she sits in on these various committees, very important. And then finally, communicates the board work to the school and parish communities. This is very, very important. Sometimes boards uh, can be the best kept, kept secret in a school or a parish community. Uh, I recall uh, when Heather was president of Bishop McNamara and I was chair of our board, one of the things I used to hear from our faculty and staff was, what do you people do at these board meetings? You know, they never knew. And I think this is true of a lot of boards. Um, 
And so what I instituted was at the following each board meeting, I would prepare a one page email summary of here are the things we talked about at a board meeting. Here are some important decisions that we have made. And you certainly don't put anything confidential in there. Uh, but this is very, very important. I had a similar experience when I was chair of the board at Mount St. Mary's University in Emmitsburg. Following every board meeting, I would meet with uh, the editor of the student newspaper. And they were interested, well, who is this board? What do they do? What do people talk about? What decisions do you make? And I found that that really um, provided a clearer understanding of the work of the board as it relates to the institution. And I think that's, that is very, very important. If I could just add uh, two things, Dan, if you don't mind. Um, when I look at this, a, a phrase that comes to mind is often used today, people say you have to stay in your own lane. And I think the challenge can be is if we are honest with ourselves, we can realize that, well, maybe someone didn't stay in their lane because we didn't clearly define the lanes and we didn't take enough time in our foundational documents and how we laid out our process. I've certainly experienced board members who were frustrated by their work because maybe they didn't know what kind of board they were joining or they didn't know what the designated responsibilities were gonna be of the board. And I've also encountered school leaders who struggled with giving any engagement to the board because they, they felt it was all in their lane. Um, so I think having that relationship and that honest reflection is important. And that's why we wanted to focus on this, this relationship in particular. Um, Dan, uh, yes. there's a question here. Yes. Uh, who, who received the one page summary of the board meetings? Who was the that, recipient? That was emailed uh, within a day or two of our board meeting to the entire faculty staff of a school. Um, it, it, not necessarily to the parent community, Although, in, as Heather would remember, the uh, president of our uh, parent association was also a member of our board. So that person could share then that information with the parents at a, at a regular board meeting. And Thank later you. on in the presentation, we're, we're gonna show um, a variety of examples on ways to communicate with your community, the work of the board. Okay. Next slide, Keith. So board recruitment and orientation. So, and, you know, I give a disclaimer here, you know, we focus first on the importance of training your board when they, be, when they get onboarded, but the training can't stop then. We have to keep the board engaged in professional discussions and learning more about their role. But as you said, with getting the right bodies on the bus, you know, board development begins with the recruitment and having a strong membership and governance committee to identify and cultivate new board members you should always be in the process of identifying possible members and have a real clear sense of what the transition is going to be or what succession planning you have to have in place. Um, and you want, when looking for candidates, board members really need to be willing to roll up their sleeves while being mindful of staying in their lane um, so that they um, want to have, they have an interest or a passion, hopefully a particular skill set that's going to be something of value add to them joining the board. You don't want to have um, folks from all one um, set of backgrounds. You know, I say we often find ourselves in a position where a lot of finance people end up on boards um, because back in the day, maybe that was the only part of the school that the board may have had a real involvement with. Uh, while that's certainly incredibly important, um, you want to make sure that you have folks that maybe ha come from a medical field or come from higher education or come from any different work, walk of life. Um, board orientation is very important. must include, among other things, informing members of the proper channels to handle problems, complaints, and concerns. So you don't want to have to wait until you have a problem or you have a disagreement among board members or an issue evolves either at the committee level or at the board meeting before you've informed the members of the board on how to properly handle a concern, um, how to raise that concern. And along with that, have confidentiality. The understanding that there will be times when work happens in the committee or especially at the board level that it is not for public consumption yet. And even if, and 
like most places, everyone overlaps each other. Everyone has multiple connections to the school. Um, they're a member of the parish. They know people that work in the school. So you want to make sure that people are understanding of the importance of confidentiality, that it's not we're not trying to be transparent. And so you want to uh, you want to offset that by having active communication about the work of the board, but some things aren't shared until they get to a certain level of development. When things are still in the infant stages or you're still workshopping an idea or a concept, you want to keep that within the board so you can have that, you know, kicking of all the tires and making sure that everyone is in agreement on how the school is going to move forward. Um, and members should not just be a name on a website or on the parish bulletin. People should know who the board members are and you want to actively make sure you've invited them to events. And when they come to events, they have a distinctive name tag so people can see them identify, oh, they're a member of the board. So that they see that the board is a true functioning board that is supporting the school and actively engaged and wants to be present. Now that doesn't mean that if you're at the potluck dinner that you want board members to then entertain grievances. Uh, so again, it goes back to the training that you've, you've prepared them how do you get yourself out of a sticky situation? So if that parent comes to the, the potluck and wants to talk about the problem they're having in the classroom or on the recess, how do they you know, respectfully you know, tell them how to resolve their problem, um, but then not get involved in anything that's gonna break their role as a board member? One of the uh, things uh, to, just to add to this is important, a way of, kind of checking out future board members is adding non-board members to various committees. Uh, it gives you an opportunity and it gives the, the full board an opportunity to observe how a person uh, handles various issues and discussions within a committee. Uh, so I've always been an advocate for that. If there are some board, potential board members, having them serve on a committee uh, kind of gives them a, an early taste of what the board is all about. But it also gives the board an opportunity to see them in action, and it helps to recruit new board members. Definitely. I mean, in many ways, the committees are, are your bench for your board. And so whenever you're inviting someone to committee, you might think at some point, would they be a person I would consider adding to the board? And this would be a way to really audition them and let them get to see the work of the board firsthand. Okay, next slide. I always like uh, Winnie Churchill's comments. He has many, many famous comments. This was an interesting one. The difference between mere management and leadership is communication. Uh, th this is important and it's an important point with regard to the management of the school and the leadership of the school. That is the, the head of school and the board chair and ultimately the board of directors. Next slide. Talk a little bit here about board committees. Um, the board committee, really, I have found my experience in uh, with boards that the real work of a board does take place within various committees. That's where the hard work is done in many ways. And they bring the results of their work uh, to the full board for approval if there's some action items or certainly for more information. Board committees usually work closely with the appropriate school counterparts, and it provides uh, avenues for fruitful and authentic collaboration. For example, if a faculty staff members are meeting with the board plant and facilities committee, uh, if the, the, the school's administrator or whoever is responsible should not chair that committee, that should be a board member chairing that committee. The finance office staff meeting with the board finance committee the HR director meeting with the board's personnel committee, and then board members should chair each of these committees. I really am a very strong advocate for that because I think it does give uh, a much more open uh, view of things. And such connections provide many opportunities for staff and administrators to interact and share concerns, ideas, and suggestions. This is where a board and the staff can even strengthen the communication between the school and and the uh, board. Okay. So board communication. Um, and just before we move on, I just wanted one more point on, on the last slide about the board committees. So 
later in our series, we are gonna have a session just on strategic planning. But certainly these board committees and the work of the board, always you wanna align it with your strategic plan. And ideally your, your committees will be very specific to your location and what designated responsibilities have been given to the board and then should align with your plan so that everything is working in unison. And that's how you're really building that synergy to have the board have a real impact. Um, and then getting um, back to board communication, Keith, next slide back again. So we, we talked, we touched on this a few times so far, and it's obviously a point that Dan and I both feel really strongly about that. And I think part of why we feel strongly about it is we know that this is sometimes not given enough of a priority. It can certainly slip through the cracks that we all know what the board is doing. We're all knee deep in, in what the board's doing. We know how much work has gone into uh, the planning. Um, but if your constituents you know, think it's all happening in a vacuum and they don't feel like they're aware of what's going on, they don't feel the same level of attachment. Um, so some examples. So boards should determine how to best communicate its work, decisions, and various topics to the faculty, staff, parishioners, parents, alumni, and students. And as Dan's example well illustrates, having the specific letter to the school staff. So you don't necessarily communicate to all these constituent groups exactly the same way. You also you know, often may say, well, I think the staff needs to hear this first. We're making this decision. We've made this investment. We're doing this initiative. We want to share that with the faculty and staff first um, or and the parish leadership first. And then we'll publicize it to the, the broader community. Um, also, you want to think about, as we look at these examples, different platforms and mediums. So, you know, there's different, you know, nuance to how you use your social media or how you use email versus print. And, and often we kind of pigeonhole our, our board updates to a letter in the bulletin or a letter in the newsletter. But if you've got your board member at an event, then showcase that on social media too. Um, you know, use your LinkedIn page for the, for the school. So figure out what is the best way to reach all of your constituents, because we've seen, and I've seen that different members or community are going to engage differently with your communication. Some members of the community might read the full newsletter. Some might only glance at an email. Some might only be on Facebook. Uh, most of our current elementary school parents are only on Instagram. So if you send the message, but it's not going the right direction that they're going to see it and hear it, then it's not going to have the impact you're looking for it to have. Ryan, we have a question uh, about sure. board communication. Um, Melissa Hernandez wants to know how frequently should boards meet and what's a good rule of thumb on the frequency of these meetings? Well, I think it's a good question. In my experience, because the committee work and every board member is asked to be engaged at least one committee, those committees for the most part are gonna meet every month throughout the school year, probably taking the summer off unless there's a special project. So if you're going into a capital campaign, maybe your development committee is gonna meet all summer long. Um, but for the most part, I'd say every month, maybe taking off December and whatever month we have Easter this year, um, but about every month. So with that in mind, you wanna be sensitive to how much you're asking of your board members. So the full board maybe will only meet four times a year or five times a year. Um, it's probably more valuable to have a board retreat than have a lot of other meetings. So having fewer meetings, but allowing a full Saturday that you can really do that deep thinking and really engage in conversation and discussion is probably gonna have a bigger impact than meeting every month. Um, and also another thing is you wanna be really precious with the time you have with your board. Everyone's given up a lot of other things to come to that meeting. And so inviting 12 people to come spend time and their time is spent hearing reports is not sensitive to them and it's not gonna move the needle forward. If you can send emails ahead of time and have a consent agenda so that all of that other work happens offline, then you, your meeting time is more valuable. You know, I've, I've seen boards fall into a pattern where maybe they meet every month and they have an hour and a half meeting, but an hour and 15 minutes of it are the different committees giving a report. And then at the end, we've run out of time and we didn't really get to have a conversation. 
So, so that, that was my long winded way of saying, I think that your committees need to meet certainly every month. I think with a conversation with the board members, you know, four meetings a year, quarterly meetings might be sufficient. Dan, would you agree? I would agree with that. I, it, it is important um, to set a schedule ahead of time for the whole year, I think in terms of board meetings and committee meetings so that members know they don't get a, a notice a week before a meeting is scheduled and they didn't have it in their calendar. I think that kind of communication is, is so very, very important. Um, but yes, I fully agree with what you're saying, Ryan, yes. And I would encourage you, uh, certainly right now, most boards are meeting virtually or by Zoom. Um, I think that retaining the, the place of some virtual meetings could be really valuable because you might have meeting time that needs to just be tactical or needs right. to be something you can handle in a Zoom. Now, for example, our board, every late December, we approve the preliminary budget. So it certainly makes the most sense to send the materials ahead of time and have a Zoom conversation that folks can work into their workday and you're not asking too much of the board. And then that, again, there's other times where you really need to be in each other's presence. So as long as we can do that safely, then you wanna have those times as well. Um, I would highly um, guide you against hybrid meetings. I, I think that Every, everyone feels like that short change in a hybrid meeting. If you're not there, you feel like you didn't have the full experience. Um, and sometimes if you're in person, uh, the person at home might be able to chime in more quickly because they're able to type in the chat and you might not you know, interrupt somebody in person. So I think it's um, hopefully lessons we're learning. Um, so going, were there any other questions? No. Um, no so following, I'm sorry, good. So just a few other topics. There's a following board meeting. The chair should prepare a summary um, that you know can be shared in various types of ongoing communication. It might be the weekly newsletter or the parish bulletin. Um, and everyone needs to leave your board meeting with a clear sense of what action they're taking. You know, the other pitfall you can have is having members really engage at the board meeting. But if they don't know what action they have to go into next or what they're bringing back to their committee, then you can get into this loop of not really making progress. You're just recovering the same topic every month or every meeting. Yeah. All right, Keith, go ahead. I you know, I would uh, also add to that um, how important it is. Uh, you know, in, I, I live and participate in a large parish here in the Diocese of Arlington. And uh, you know, we went through a series of pastors. I mean, one for two years, another one for three years and so forth. And a large parish, and yet we had the school across the parking lot. Uh, it might as well have been 10 miles away, the building, uh, because nobody in the parish, nobody got any information about that school. And so we've got to finally got a new pastor who is absolutely pro-Catholic schools, and there is in the parish bulletin every weekend a full page about the school. And it has really brought a whole new level of interest uh, to the uh, school as an important part of that parish community. And I think that's all very, very, very important. I really, I think so. Um, ideas for successful board communication. I think we've touched on a couple of these and um, Preparing, I talked about preparing an executive summary of the topics discussed, actions that were taken. I think that's important to email it to not only your staff, but if you're in a parish school, the faculty members, the pastor, the uh, uh, parochial vicars, uh, maybe even the chair of the finance committee of a parish or the chair of a parish finance, uh, par parish council. I think having a community committee like that, a uh, communication like that, I think is very, very important. Also emailing it to parent leaders, to volunteers, um, creating a section on the school and parish websites to update and share the work of the board. That's been one of the new things in this parish that I belong to that has been done. I think it's been very, very effective. And certainly sharing the information about the board work with benefactors and with others. Uh, sometimes people may give a major donation to a school and then you, you, know, you thank them publicly, then they never hear another word from that school. 
it's important to keep benefactors in the loop, if you will, with regard to that school, because what it will probably generate is more, more uh, donations or more connections with you will, not only with that benefactor, but they may know some other benefactors who could be of help. And so uh, the creating a, a school page on the parish bulletin is, is again, very, very important. And I've talked enough about that, but it is important in terms of board communication to let people know what is going on and what kind of uh, projects are they working on. And I think to build on that, um, yeah. having served in a parish school as, as a practical example. Um, so typically the parish school is the largest single line item in the parish's budget. And it's a huge part investment that they're making. Um, and I was a scenario when I started at my previous school that the only time that the principal and the, and the school board interacted with the parish finance council was once a year when we were going to them and hopefully approving what the investment that the parish is going to make in the school is going to be for that coming year. And that's not a way to build a relationship. Um, and it certainly is not a way to convince the, the parish finance committee, which is not uh, by nature, they're usually people that don't want to part, part with the dollar. Um, that's sort of their, that's part of their role. Um, but if they feel that they really have an investment in the school, a true investment, not just a financial one, but a mission driven investment, and you have that relationship, you know, when you have a need. And so when the boiler breaks and it wasn't in the budget and we got to solve this problem, it can't be going to the parish. It has to be our school has this problem. How are we going to solve it? Thanks, Keith. So I, we've mentioned a few times about the key constituent groups. So just to review, um, the, the board you know, has to see itself as being related with all these different groups and having a relationship and being understood by all those different groups. And we have to avoid the, the pitfall of focusing only on one. And sometimes it might be the loudest voice in the room or the ones with whom we see or interact the most frequently. So we may focus solely on the current parents because maybe that's who we're hearing from the most. Um, but certainly the faculty and staff, those are our boots on the ground. That is the first, that is the how the, the representatives of the board by living that mission every day in the school and they need to see themselves as being partnership with the board. Mm -hmm. Students. Uh, students need to really understand that the school is more than just the teachers and the principal that they see every day, that it's a lot of people that are dedicated to this mission. That's part of what makes our school so unique. Our schools are truly deep communities, and we want to make sure that we're doing everything possible to make that a reality. Obviously, our current families, um, you know, some schools may have a requirement that there are current families on the board and other schools may have one that isn't. So probably all of you have different uh, foundational documents that determine those things. So you may have only alumni parents on your board, or you may have a certain percentage of parents, um, but you wanna make sure that you're speaking to them. But then also, as we've you know said several times, the whole community, so the parishioners, alumni, um, sometimes we underestimate the importance of alumni. Um, and the larger community, you know, we are a community within another community. So we should be in, you know, core to the fabric of the town where we reside. And those relationships will serve us well if we earn the respect of the larger community. Next slide, Keith. So community engagement best practices. So, um, Again, some of these we have touched on, but in general, board activities or work should be highlighted in various school communications. Parishes should highlight activities on the school on the school website and on the parish website. Um, inviting board members to various school functions, so making sure that they have an opportunity to interact with folks at events, um, informal and informal. You know, not just graduation. Have them come to the fun things. You know, schools are about fun and kids, and sometimes we um, can be too formal. Um, we want to want people to feel really part of a larger family. Um, having that space set aside in your ongoing communication so that it's not just here and there, but it's on a set you know, routine. Next slide.
There we go. I'm sure many of us uh, in Catholic education have this little book. It's called The National Standards and Benchmarks. Uh, and you see a picture of the cover of that. This is something that was developed about 10 years ago. Uh, and Regina certainly remembers this as I do. We were both at NCEA at the time and working with our superintendents and a, with a group of Catholic higher education institutions that uh, allowed us to, who have schools of education, allowed us to develop some national standards and benchmarks. What are the key elements to very successful Catholic elementary and secondary schools? And out of that came uh, a number of efforts and working with Loyola, uh, Loyola Chicago, Loyola University of Chicago, the National Catholic Educational Association and Boston College Lynch School of Education. It took us several years. And as this was being developed at each of our annual meeting of superintendents, and I was chair of that uh, department, executive director of that department at NCEA, this would be a major topic at every one of our uh, regular meetings. And we developed this, we fine tuned it and so forth. And so it came out, uh, as, as you can see, if you can show the next slide, there were a number of standards. I'm not gonna go through all of the standards. And certainly each one of them probably has a connection with regard to, uh, with regard to Catholic schools. Uh, and the standard five title was governance and leadership. And the introduction to this particular section said, governance and leadership based on the principles and practices of excellence are essential to ensuring the Catholic identity, academic excellence, and operational vitality of the school. Uh, you should, if you are not familiar with uh, these standards, I really recommend getting them. These are available through NCEA. You may probably also be able to go on NCEA and pull them, pull them up and, and you can see them yourself. Let's jump to the next slide. Standard five says an excellent Catholic school has a governing body which recognizes and respects the roles of the appropriate and legitimate authorities and exercises responsible decision making in collaboration with the leadership team for development and oversight of the school's fidelity to mission, academic excellence, and operational vitality. Those three areas are the other standards uh, of the benchmarks. You can jump to the next slide. And then there's a standard, and then there's a list of benchmarks for each of these standards. And I'll, I just pulled two of those out from within this uh, standard on governance, 5.1 and 5.6. 5.1 says the governing body representing the diversity of stakeholders, that would be parents and so forth, functions according to its approved constitution and bylaws. Here again, this goes back to the proper training of board members that they understand uh, the constitution and bylaws of the particular board and also of the school. And then the fifth 5.6 uh, benchmark says the governing body engages in formation and ongoing training and self-evaluation for itself and the leadership team to ensure the faithful execution of their respective responsibilities. That is a very important point. All these two benchmarks are what boards need to really be focused on, uh, not just at the, you know, every two or three years. It really needs to be a focus. Of, of the work of the board, making sure that board, board members understand what their role is, understand the constitution and bylaws. I'd be willing to bet my last dollar that a lot of school boards probably only look at the constitution and bylaws when they bring a new member on board. Uh, you know, it's important to maybe part of each board meeting, kind of take a section of the bylaws and constitution and kind of talk about it a little bit. I also think it's very important for every board to have at the very top of its agenda what the vision statement is for that school and what the mission statement of that school. And having that at the very top of your agenda kind of 
brings that to home to people so that they are reminded uh, very clearly about that. The next slide. I could just add. Um, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Sorry. Just to go back to, you know, because you made some, there were some really important points in these, these past few slides. And, you know, you want to, I think for me, there's three things you want to, there are three categories. You've got the mission, the vision statement. So whatever work you're doing as a board, you start with, and it should be automatic for all the board members. You know, how does this align with our mission and our vision? And then you've created the, the constitution bylaws. So any work you're doing, if you're regularly reminding and looking at those documents and they are living documents, then you're saying, is this within the authority of the board? Is this in the work that we are supposed to be tackling? And then by the standards and benchmarks, by making your board familiar with the standards and benchmarks, then your last step is, and are we meeting with best practice? Are we keeping our board and our school on par with what the standards are for best practice for our Catholic schools? And that does take work and ongoing work. And as Dan said, you can't do it just one, one time at orientation and then not use that language and incorporate that process in all of the work that you're doing as a board. Very good points, very, very important. But I think in, a school needs to have that understanding of what its mission and vision is. It yes. needs to have that in front of them every day, every time they meet. Yes, uh, I have a question uh, here. Oh, yes, Dr. Haney, a question from the peanut gallery. <laughs> <laughs> here it is. You know, you talk about authority and uh, when you were going through the standard five there to show respect for the authority, how do you, how do you help your board understand who that authority is and, and emphasizing the importance of respecting that authority. Could you give some, some ways to do that, both from Ryan's perspective with a elementary and you, Dan, through a diocesan school and a, a secondary school? Right, Ryan? Sure, I mean, and I've had experience of working in a parish diocesan school or two parish diocesan schools and now working for an independent Catholic school that is owned and operated by a religious order. And I think, you know, as a head of school, you're always in this kind of multi-pronged relationship. So that as a head of school, you've been designated certain responsibilities by either the pastor who has canonical authority of that school and then end the diocese or the religious congregation. And so for the board to then see how the head of school and their role and responsibilities and then what responsibilities the head of school and the other governing body is designating to the board. So what have we identified? And that all should be spelled out very clearly in those foundational documents. So that maybe the pastor has said, I am going to trust the academic leadership and the Catholic identity to the head of school. Um, that person needs to be the faith leader and the academic leader on a day-to-day -day basis. But we have these wonderfully invested individuals who bring great expertise and they will be given greater authority around finances, facilities and grounds, development and fundraising, enrollment and admissions. They're all interrelated because obviously the, the academic leader needs to have the support of how he provides that pro he or she provides that programming. Right. So it's not that you're, there isn't hard lines but there needs to be lines to show who has which authority. And so that like you said, you, you don't go out of your lane. Um, and I think so understanding that other body that's also has ultimate authority um, for, the, for the school is important. Dan? Uh, do you have yeah, time I... for another question? Okay. Or do you have time for another question? Or do oh, you... we always oh, have time for another question. Of course, question. I didn't know if Dan wanted to add anything about no, I, I think I think I agree with you 100 percent, Brian. It is important that at the beginning of each year that there be a board retreat, uh, that you pull together your your members for usually an all day or some places do it an overnight retreat in which you start looking ahead for the year. What are the issues that we're going to be facing? You know, you don't know everything. You can't read the tea leaves immediately. But that's an opportunity, I think, to review the bylaws, to uh, go through the purpose of a board, 
how it relates to the school, how the school relates to the board and so forth. You know, talking about those, those important documents, if you're in a school uh, like we are at Bishop McNamara High School where we have the Brothers of Holy Cross, we have to understand what is the connection with the religious community of that school. Uh, I often say, and I think Heather would agree with this, uh, we haven't had a brother on the faculty or staff of this school for probably 10 or more years. But yet that school has more understanding of the mission of Holy Cross and the teachings of Holy Cross in terms of the faith formation, the academic form formation of students than when we had 20 some brothers uh, living at the school. So it is important to keep that focus in front of board members, at least annually. Very, very important. Yes, and, um, and I would say, even if it's not owned by a congregation, but like I've been in a parish school where there was a congregation that served in that school for 80 plus years. And even if there's no longer sisters or brothers in residence, you have a responsibility to maintain that charism. That should be part of your school. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. I was in a school and the sisters moved on, but we were still a mercy school and that was really important to us. Heather, did, did you have another question? Uh, we did. We had a question from one of our participants who says, would our speakers provide a specific example of a board initiative and how it relates to bylaws and also how that initiative can be measured. Hmm. Brian, what's your answer to that? It's a good question. So I would say, so this would be a, an example. So I, um, and this was something that we had done at one of my schools. So, and it's really, really timely because retention is a challenge for faculty and staff. You know, we've all read about the great resignation. And so I was in a setting where we saw that there was a higher than usual turnover and we were having trouble. We were having a lot of early in career teachers coming for a few years and then moving on. And so the board identified and, and I went to the board saying, we need to figure out how we are able to better support our teachers and identify what the concerns are. And so the direct HR components are not areas where the board would be involved but the financial components. So if we're analyzing what is our salary structure like? Um, how do we compare to schools in the area? Are there soft benefits or hard benefits that we could provide? Um, is there other teacher appreciation initiatives? Um, that then went into our marketing and communications committee. We said, well, part of how we market our school is the strength of our teachers, but then also how do we brand what we're doing for the teachers so that they see it and recognize it and the community sees it and recognize it, so that, that we're making a real intentional effort. So those were initiatives that parts of them were owned by the board. And then they had to work with me as the head of school on the areas, you know, they're not having the direct conversation with the staff member and they're, they're seeing the salaries in aggregate. They're not knowing exactly where everyone is on the guide. Um, and then to measure it, we set goals of, as a board, how much, how do we wanna increase our teacher retention? Um, and if we feel we need to look at our salary guide and bring it up to a different level, how are we gonna do that? What percentages are we looking and over what period of time? You know, you can't go from one year and then suddenly you've increased the salaries tremendously. You have to have a plan to make that happen. So then you can measure your success by how are you financially funding this program? How successful is the program? Are you keeping teachers? And then is that having an impact on, on admissions? Because really part of what first started the conversation was families were getting upset because we had a high teacher turnover. And I don't know who I'm gonna have for my math teacher in middle school. Because we know that the, the most highly discussed position in any elementary school is the middle school math teacher. Um, that is the one that drives most of the questions to the principal when it comes to teachers. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm jesting, but it's not too far from the truth. Um, Ryan, I, I think you, I think you raise a, I think you raise a very, very good point. Uh, we had the experience this year of the board that I serve on at McNamara, where I chair the personnel committee, and this very topic really came up uh, in terms of we're losing some good teachers. Uh, we didn't lose as many because we addressed the salary issue very, very critically early on. 
but how do we keep good teachers? And so we, as a personnel committee, did a lot of national research and we were able to pull up some good suggestions and some good ideas. And one of those was uh, having a teacher who really loves being at the school mm. kind of do a, a, a video that can be posted on the school website about why do they teach in this school? What do they find uh, exciting about coming to this high school every day? And we had a couple of, I, I saw one, there may be some others now, where they implemented, the, the school implemented that recommendation from our committee, which was approved by the board. And sure enough, we had uh, one, two teachers on, on the website talking about why do they teach at the school? What do they find exciting about it? And it really has helped to, uh, I think, one way of addressing, there are a number of other issues recommendations that we made, but that was one that the school immediately picked up and ran with it. And that was a recommendation from our committee through the board approval process and then on to the administration. I don't know if that answers the question that- uh, mm -hmm. Yes. You uh, asked. Our participant says, thank you for that excellent example. Great, good. And I would just warn everybody that, you know, this is something that's gonna continue to be a challenge is Absolutely. retaining staff. Um, one of the biggest drivers now, maybe an offshoot of the amount of time that some of us spent working from home or hybrid, is people want more flexibility in, in their, in their work-life balance. And unfortunately, being a teacher is probably the least flexible schedule you're ever going to get. You don't even get to decide when you go to the restroom or when you eat lunch. So it's, it's a hard thing. So you really have to be creative to see how are we finding ways to meet some of that need. So yeah. hopefully folks on your board, you want to have someone that has an HR background um, or can bring you best practices um, because also your, your school leader might not have had some of that training. And so you want to make sure that it's a value add. I know at this, uh, this at Bishop McNamara, we, and I don't use that as an example. There are many other schools like that. Uh, we moved in the direction of hiring a full-time HR director. Uh, about two years ago. And I can't tell you how that has improved, uh, you know, the life of the school in many ways. And um, that has been very, very successful. So there are different things that you can try. And I'm sure we all have different ideas that we could share. This next slide is a picture of Dr. Regina Haney. Uh, this is her first communion picture, I think. Uh, maybe it's her confirmation picture. I don't know. But as, as many of you know, I tried to slide, put this in to kind of surprise her, but she found out about it. But as you know, Regina talked about uh, her career and um, uh, we were colleagues together at NCEA and she was head of the boards, ed Catholic Education Boards and Councils Department, which for some reason has been disbanded by NCEA, but that's another whole story. But she has done a lot of, of uh, important work in terms of what Catholic education boards and councils should look like. You go to the next slide. Now, this is a picture of Regina when she was in school. And you can see that she was a little bit of a troublemaker. Uh, she's always outside the principal's office. I think they were going to name that pew, that pew uh, after her and so forth. But it was a an example is a Norman Rockwell picture that I saw, and I just had to put that in here for, for levity, if nothing else. Um, the next uh, slide. And the reason I point to uh, Dr. Haney uh, and her work really goes back to, uh, if you look at the growth of Catholic school boards and councils from 1994, and that's about the time that she began working uh, maybe a little bit earlier in this department and to see how important it was. And you can see in 1994, only about 14% of Catholic schools had boards or councils of Catholic education. And then you see the, the change every couple of years, how it has increased. And it has gotten to the point right now where at about 2020, last year's figure, about 85% of Catholic schools had boards and councils of education. And I think this is important because of the effort that the boards and councils department at NCEA really, through Dr. Haney's work really imposed how important boards are to the future of Catholic education in this country. And you can see the results of that effort uh, through various workshops and so forth. 
at the end of the uh, slides, I'll, uh, I have a connection with regard to the where you can find out a lot of publications that are available through NCEA um, in, uh, in terms of board formation, board training, board in servicing, and so forth. Uh, but this is an important thing to see this. I think what's also important to think historically, and I teach a course on the history of Catholic education, before, uh, after the uh, Vatican Council in, in mid-60s, uh, we saw the transition from mostly religious schools, uh, staffed by religious communities, to lay. And I think the importance of having boards became much more evident and important as we had more and more and more lay teachers and lay administrators, lay head of schools in our, our schools across the country, and they needed to be trained. And here's the result of that. It's been very, very successful. Regina, did you want to refute anything I've said? <laughs> All right, go to the next slide. Regina's probably taking a nap. No, 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 no. <laughs> These are, Regina worked very closely. This is really a national understanding of how effective boards are. And there are 12 important items. The first one, I think we've talked about board development and training, how critical that is. The second one is competencies and capabilities. How competent are your board members? Do you appoint people to your board or select people for consideration of board membership based on a, on a competency or a, a, an ability they have in an area that is of great need uh, within a school? I point to technology as an example. Third part of this is how well do your committees, how well are they formed? How well do they work? Uh, what projects do they take on? Uh, very, very important. The fourth point is communication is a two-way street. I talked earlier about the head of school and the board chair, how important that communication is. It's a two-way street. The next point is governing documents. Understanding what are the governing documents of that particular school. If it's a parish school, if it's a diocesan school, if it's a school sponsored by a religious community, understanding the governing documents of the connection between those entities and that particular school. The other important fact is leadership succession. You know, you don't want to be caught uh, this month, let's say May, your, your principal is resigning and leaving. You need to know along the lines of leadership succession so that it's carried out very effectively and very successfully. So those are the first uh, six. I'll let uh, Ryan, talk about the, the next six. Thanks, Dan. So collaborative leadership team. So um, who are the officers of your board and how is that? So we, we focus especially on the board chair and the head of school, but then all those other board members, what committees they lead and you probably have a vice chair, maybe you have a treasurer or secretary. So how does that leadership work? And then if you're in a power school, how does that work with the, pa with the pastor? Membership. We said that you have to actively be recruiting always. You're always recruiting new members for your committees and your board. And you're always looking for what the, su the succession plan is. So how many more years does each member have in their term? Um, how are you actively? And then, you know, things happen. So making sure that you're checking in with your board members to make sure that they can continue. You know, you'll often have a, someone that may have to step off the board. So you don't wanna be scrambling um, if that happens unexpectedly, you have a backup plan. Um, the parish school relationship, that the, the, if you're in a parish or if you're in, uh, if you're a congregational school that you have that relationship with the larger community. Planning, that you've established an ongoing process for strategic planning and for reviewing all of the work of your committees and all of your documents. So that if you approve your board uh, uh, authority documents, your, your bylaws, your constitution, that you have a schedule of how often you're gonna revisit that and when it might need to be updated. That you're always in a strategic planning process. You're always in a three to five year plan and getting ready for the next three to five year plan. And the board you know, owns that process and is, is engaged in that process. Um, response to the call to serve, that it is really, it's, 
you're asking a lot of volunteers, but this is, uh, there should be a passion and an excitement to be part of this process. And the best way to engage that is make sure you give the board, you know, valuable work to do. Um, spirituality, your Catholic identity should be woven into everything that you do. Um, and it should be, there should be a retreat that is a planning retreat, but it has a faith-based component to it as well. And that you're starting with prayer and you're ending with prayer. And that, that Catholic identity is at the forefront of the work of the board. You know, it's also important in terms of the response to the call to serve. That really grew out of the Vatican Council to get more people involved in the work, uh, the important work of their, of their school. Uh, and that really has really opened the gates, if you will, for, you know, parish councils, parish finance councils, uh, school councils, school boards, and so forth. I think we did get a question from Sister Rosemary in the, in the chat. Um, should there be board term limits? Definitely. That Absolutely. should definitely be in your bylaws. You know, I'd say the norm would be that a board member can serve two consecutive three-year terms and then maybe needs to take a break. Um, whatever you collectively agree upon, it's important to have that fresh voice and perspective coming into the board. Now, board member can take a break or can stay on their committee, but you need to have you know, new blood always coming in. It can't become the Supreme Court where everyone is on it for, for life. Well, you know, that, that's true. And I remember uh, uh, a high school uh, board, uh, they never changed members. It was on there forever, forever. And I, we've, when I was working in the Diocese of Arlington, we, we've moved away from that, but it took a time because some of these people were on over 12, 14 years with no term limits and it just went on and on. It was the same old boys network. And that's not good for the future of a school. Uh, so that is very, very important. Great, so now we are um, gonna take a little bit of a break um, to have you go into some breakout groups in just a moment. And we'll add to this, so our, um, our main question is how can we best leverage the strengths of the board to support the vital vitality of the school and support the mission as well as a strategic vision for the future? So how are we supporting the board to really make that impact? And then as you say, to also have a discussion about what have your key takeaways been um, from the, these conversations we've been having with you tonight and any areas where you want to explore more deeply. So I would ask, I think you're gonna be in groups of around five, maybe six, and you'll be going to your breakout room for just about five minutes, so a short conversation. And if you could select someone from within your group to share a, a couple thoughts or points that you had when you return. So that Dan and I won't be doing all the talking. <laughs> Okay, so you should have a request to join, so please join and we'll see you in a little bit.
Uh, everyone, I will be closing the room in one minute. Everyone will be returning in the next 60 seconds. Being recorded. So I I'm thinking we should all be back. Keith, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if everyone has returned from their breakout sessions. Just about 25 more seconds and we'll have everybody back. Okay. I feel like we're in that, the old Star Trek show when you'd be in the transporter, you'd go and you'd come back again. So that's kind of what it feels like sometimes. Ryan, we it. also have a couple of questions for you in the chat room. So let us know when you're ready for those as well. Everyone is now back. Okay, sure. Well, um, maybe we'll, should we take the questions first? And then we certainly would welcome um, the different groups to share any feedback or, or thoughts that generate in their small group. Um, All right. One of the questions from one of our participants is, what is a consent agenda? Uh, good question. So a consent agenda is that you've sent all the board reports ahead of time and you set the expectation that everyone reads the report and it often would be items that don't require action at that time. So then you would go through the list on the, on the agenda would say, this is a consent agenda. Does anyone have any thoughts or remarks they wanna make based on the reports? So if something comes up that there's a need to clarify something or someone has a question, you can have conversation. But in most instances, if it's not something that's requiring the board's action, it's just informative, you can then move on to the topics you've decided you wanna talk about. Um, so a good format for that is, is you might have a set rotation that certain committees are not consent agenda items at each meeting. So you might say, okay, every October, we're gonna hear from our enrollment and marketing committee, and we're gonna have some deeper dive into a, a topic or an issue that we're trying to resolve. In order to do that, we're gonna say all the other committees will not present live. You'll send your reports ahead of time and we'll, we'll handle that first. Now, if there's a, a topic that needs to be addressed because there was a concern or there was an issue, you can do that. But typically that doesn't take a lot of time out of your precious time as a board. I think that's a, just to add to what Ryan is, uh, is uh, pointing out, I agree with him 100%. Um, <clears throat> I have been on boards where uh, every uh, committee uh, report was reviewed line by line, word by word, and you never really get anything done. It's important that various materials, committee reports, be in the hands of board members. I always say a, a, at least two weeks in advance of a board meeting so that you hopefully they everyone has a chance to read through those if they have any questions for clarification, that's when they would uh, that's when they would bring it up when when it comes time for that committee report. Heather, is there another yes, question? There is. You've got a lot of questions here. Okay. Uh, one of the other questions is: Could you explain how a board of limited jurisdiction? is different from other governing structures? Well, I would say 
um, the model had been strictly advisory boards so that the board would give advice or counsel on a topic, but they didn't have decision-making authority. Um, a board can be given limited jurisdiction. So often say for the pastor, now the pastor will have ultimate authority of a parish school, but he can designate authority and say, I entrust the board to set the budget for the school and to oversee the finances of the school. So in that decision-making stance, they have authority. They've been given and trusted that authority by the board. It's, there's still oversight, obviously, by the head of school and by the pastor, but they're making decisions. Um, facilities. So the board may create a campus plan, a facilities master plan, and they're gonna oversee that we're gonna tackle these projects over the course of the next five years, and they have that authority. Now they have to have a plan and oversight. They can't just suddenly say, oh, well, we're gonna fit with the cafeteria because we wanna build a, a new jungle gym. Um, but they're they're entrusted with that authority. And so then by the same token, the, the head of school and the, and the pastor have to trust that authority. So it can't be that we work around them and just make decisions. Oh, well, I decided we wanted to build the playground, even though, and I, and I signed off on the contract, even though I never consulted with you. So there's a different level of skin in the game when you're giving the board that level of authority, but it requires trust and it requires people understanding that there will be scenarios where ultimately the, the governing body, you know, the pastor or the diocese could overrule them. Um, but I hopefully did, did, did that explain it well? I, Dan, I, you're I would add, add to what Ryan is saying. This goes right back to orientation of board members yeah, so that they understand these kinds of issues, what you can and what you cannot do. I think that's an important aspect of this. Next. There, I, I have a question here. Um, you talk about the importance of diversity on the board, bringing different perspectives, but could you and Dan give us tips for how do you create an agenda so it does allow for the board to be engaged in rich discussion? The agenda and, and to make sure they're proactive versus reactive and they're thinking about tomorrow. How do you structure your agenda to, to get the board engaged in rich conversation? Well, I think you have to have, those items need to be open-ended. It can't be, you can't ask yes or no questions and expect to have a conversation. So you can't come with all the problems already solved and just looking for the board to agree with your solutions. You're coming with problems that need to be weighed and evaluated and looked at and measured from different perspectives and identify as a board. So this is the problem. If we have a problem that we have a building that's in really poor condition and we have limited finances to be able to renovate this building, how are we going to come up with a plan and prioritize what we need to do? And so then you can have that rich discussion and, and bring all that to the forefront and then hopefully you're then giving everybody one or more tasks to take with them after they leave the meeting. So your chair of the facilities committee is going to get some volunteer members who have expertise and start creating a, um, a campus master plan. And maybe it's to the point where you need to bring in an architect or an engineer to solve a problem. But then your development committee is looking at what they're gonna do to help fundraise. And you know, maybe the head of school is gonna go back and work with their academic team and say, well, programmatically, what are the things that we need? So what are the problems with our school? If our school was built a hundred years ago, and we want to teach the way we want to teach today. What are the needs? So you're 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 finding meaty work that the board can do. You're not just putting items that aren't going to require a lot of discussion, or aren't just cheerleading. You know, I think that's something that mm -hmm. I've, you can fall into. That we're all just so you know everyone loves the board so much, and they're all kind, wonderful people, and they want to um, support the school leader. They want to support each other. There's, there's nothing wrong with having a little bit of an argument or a conflict or a, a discussion. Um, if it's just all, you know, you telling me how wonderful I am and I'm picking people that I know are going to tell me how wonderful I am and how wonderful the school is, um, that's a good way to have a board go to nowhere. Yeah. 
So your agenda would, would stipulate discussions and the time frame for it to ensure it happens. Yes, and I think yeah. um, typically you're gonna try to build in the start, you're getting all the business and operational things out of the way and having a real defined amount of time because you're expecting the board to have done the work ahead of time. And you're expecting to keep the business of if the chair has to give some updates or if there's a, you know, a business kind of thing that we're changing this meeting, that should all get done right away so that you have that chunk of time. And if you have more than one topic, then decide how much time you're going to spend on each right. item. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want the groups to check in, Ryan? Sure, yes. So um, would uh, the spokesperson for each group want to share a point or topic, or if there is a question that your group kind of started discussing that you'd like to share with the larger group, we'd welcome that. Um, and we're all good Catholic school people. So we're just gonna go in a very orderly fashion, one at a time. <laughs> Please raise your hand when you're ready to be called on. And you can unmute yourself when you're gonna, when you're gonna be called on. Um, So this is the virtual equivalent of not sitting in the first pew in mass. You're not gonna be the first one to answer. We all sit, you know, not quite as far back as the baptismal font, because then you can't hear, but you don't wanna be in those first, unless you're the people that arrive late, because then you walk all the way in the front and you just sit in the front. I see uh, Lynn, Lynn has her hand up. Go ahead, Lynn. Our group just stated that um, we felt the, rep we talked about representation matters and that that's a really key component we were discussing about um my school is 51 percent diverse and the other person we were discussing with she has 110 percent of her school being diverse and she doesn't have any representation of the hispanic families um on her board and we just recently had one um be appointed to our board in the past year so we just felt that that's a really strong area that we need to continue to move forward to, to have that representation of those families um, on our boards. I, I would wholeheartedly agree. And I think a piece of advice that I would give is I think we all have to be mindful that the representation matters in every component of the school. And you know, if your parent association is often gonna be a great pipeline for your board. But if you're finding that your families of color are not going or engaging in that pipeline, then that's a missed opportunity, you know, or if, or if there's other ways, it really is a long-term investment. You have to get folks involved. And, and if you're finding that a particular part of your community is not engaging with an event or with an activity that you do as a school, then why is that? Or, or how are you intentionally having ambassadors to that community to make sure that we're everyone's feeling at home everyone feels like they belong you know belonging is such a core part of who we are as, as catholic schools and i think but it always is something that really requires a lot of intention and in how we try to improve it yeah i i would uh, i would agree with with ryan very clearly it is important that uh the representation on your board reflects the representation in your student body and parent community uh, you know, if you have uh, a school that is, let's say, 85% uh, uh, African American or 60% Latino, that should be a, 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 a flag to you to say that's the kind of makeup you need on your board to, and you know, to get people involved, to get people from the various ethnic communities and very and very involved. Uh, it is so so very important. They don't so much so they don't feel like they're left out. And, you know, uh, this group over here is making all the decisions about the life of my child in this school. So it is important. It is very, very important to uh, identify people to serve on the board from various ethnic communities uh, in, your, in your school population and parish community. Gentlemen, uh, it is 727. You have a few minutes left and you have Robert, Bringus, who has raised his hand and would like to comment, I think, from his breakout. 
Yes. Uh, so I just want to share that we talked about, I talked to Tony, uh, who is a, used to be in LA where we're at, but we were talking about how board presence at schools, like sometimes uh, when you have a board, you don't realize there's a board that helps and runs things. They just think that they do all the finances, but I, I'm really looking, we have a board of limited jurisdiction and at the school that he was at, um, he had a board that really ran, they, they, they've they ran it for years. But for us, I know I one of the goals I want is our students to know that we have a board, that there's a board presence and that they're there to help um, kind of facilitate our future. So I just want to share that. And Heather, we have to, sad to say, we have to draw this to a close. We do. And I, I, I want to thank Dan and Ryan for their excellent participation presentation. And I want to thank you, this, this great audience, for your participation. So it was great. And don't forget, what are your takeaways? I would encourage you to write them down. And then how is that going to progress your board to be strategic leaders, to be engaged? And as was just mentioned about the future, how is your board moving your organization, your school into the future? So and most of all, most of all, Regina, we want to remind everyone that we look forward to seeing you again on February 24th for our fourth session, Moving to Intentional and Exceptional Governance and the Role of Generative Thinking. It's going to be presented by Dr. Marco Clark, Executive Director of the Holy Cross Institute at St. Edwards University in Austin, Texas. So we'll see you in two weeks. Stay safe and well, my friends, and may God bless you. And don't forget to take, do the evaluation that is in the chat. We're going to keep the Zoom open for five, 10 minutes. So you have time to access the link and evaluate this great session. Absolutely. Regina and I will get fired if you do not go into the chat room <laughs> and evaluations. So thank you again. <laughs>